All right, so one of the coolest things about this show is that I'll I'll do a show, I'll do an episode on something, we'll have a great conversation on a topic like, in this case, uh, intellectual property. And what that does is it, it's like a pebble dropped in a pond and, the, and it ripples out and new people that I haven't heard it before hear it and object to it and provide me their counter arguments and they give me uh, links to articles, which is one of the things we're going to be discussing today, which is exactly what I ask you guys to do and I love for you to do. I enjoy this intellectual conversation and the clash of ideas. And uh, somebody did that for us in the last intellectual property conversation video that we had. Uh, someone uh, anonymously, I guess, basically linked uh, an article called uh, The Economic Principles of Intellectual Property and the Fallacies of Intellectual Communism. And rather than me just rebut that by myself, uh, the article references a man that you guys may know. So rather than just me doing it by myself, I reached out. And we have a cool show for you today. Let's get into it. He has a plan, she has a plan, and you get to pay for it regardless. The best way to get someone motivated is to stand for something strongly, deeply, passionately. Subscribe to Disenthrall. Do as you're told. Our special guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is none other than Stephen Kinsella. He is a libertarian writer, a registered patent attorney in Houston. He has spoken, lectured, and published widely on various areas of libertarian legal theory and on legal topics such as intellectual property law and international law. His publications include Law in a Libertarian World, Legal Foundations of a Free Society, Against Intellectual Property, International Investment, Political Risk and Dispute Resolution, A Practitioner's Guide, and several others. And he's a multiple-time returning guest to the show. Welcome back. Stefan, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Glad to be here on this nice Sunday, speaking into my MacBook mic. <laughs> you sound good, man. You sound good. You sound good. So, good. uh I guess just to sort of kick this off, what happened was, what had happened was uh, a couple, like a week or two ago, we had a conversation where somebody was uh, very unconvinced about intellectual property, their income and much of what they do for a living is all wrapped up in it. And and uh, so, of course, when you challenge this sort of sacred cow where people derive their paychecks from, their, you know, their default position is to be against you. And this guy was one of the rare people in the world that are willing to have their ideas challenged. He sort of submitted himself to the panel and we had a great discussion about intellectual property in which we found out afterwards, uh, he messaged us and said that we were convincing. So um, that was awesome. And then in the comments of that video, uh, somebody that I'm not familiar with linked this article and said that it was basically the definitive final, most consistent position uh, that an anarcho-capitalist person would hold on intellectual property. So, of course, I clicked, uh, you know, I searched for it immediately and found this article. And at the very top, it makes some very strong claims that say your name, sir. So uh, uh, the first thing I did following that was to reach out to you and see if you had already um, rebutted this article so I could share that and examine it as well. Turns out you hadn't, so I'm lucky. And we get to do, you called it a fisking. I had not heard the word fisking before uh, your response in Twitter, but uh, today <laughs> we are going to give this article a good fisking, F-I-S-K. I, 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 I think I heard Walter, I, I got think Walter Block does this. He'll take an article, he'll just exhaustively go through it. And the problem is, you know, it takes like five times the length of the original article or the time that someone would have to read it to really fist these things that are so confused. It's just usually not even worth it, especially if it's an amateur kind of scattershot half-ass effort like this is. But um, um, yeah, I knew about this article from 10 years ago or 12, 11 years ago now. Uh, I don't know who the guy is. He goes by Strangerous Thoughts. Maybe I do know who he is, but I've forgotten. But um yeah, I knew about it. I, I I skimmed it and I thought, you know, it's just, what can you say? It's so confused. It's not worth doing in print. But I figure since someone brought it up, yeah, I could. And there's others. People have done this before. There's a guy named Silas Barta who's written a, a, a rebuttal of me. And then there's um, Greg Perkins. But they're always kind of incoherent and not comprehensive. And they always have flaws. So I've never really responded 
in depth to all of them. But in any case, uh, I thought we could see what we could do today. We, we can't take seven hours to do it, but we're going to take whatever time we need to to give people the gist of what's wrong with this critique. Yeah, thank you. And so to that end, I spent some time last night going through it and sort of pre-compiling the most salient points and summarizing a lot of the sections. A lot of it I'm going to read uh, because I just can't formulate whatever he's trying to say <laughs> in any kind of summary other than his own words. So uh, also, um, it's a big, it's an important thing that I do on this channel. You guys will know that if I have a disagreement with somebody, one of the first things I do is invite them on the show. This person was anonymous. Their blog is anonymous. There was no contact form on their WordPress site and their uh, a Twitter account that I think I found that was theirs was uh, no longer active. So um, I was not able to reach out to this guy if he thinks uh, well, he... In his defense, if I wrote something like this, I'd want to be anonymous too. Ooh, let the fisking begin. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to read, I guess, the intro and then um, I'm going to hand it over to you. I think you had some thoughts that you wanted to say at the very beginning. Um, the title well, of the article... Before you do that, let's let's explain. So this article is he goes he he has an introduction which you can go into, but he then he has seventeen fallacies of mine, I guess, or IP opponents that he wants to rebut. Um, so this is what the article is seventeen. I don't I don't know if we could even do seventeen. So we'll yeah. see how we're, how we we'll get to them. But anyway, that's what it is. So we're going to go through his as much of his seventeen fallacies as we can. But go ahead and start. Yeah, some of them are not our position, so we can skip some of it. So um, now that uh, now that Stefan Catella has admitted that intellectual property is a negative servitude, he says, uh, and has a legitimate precedent in property rights, the libertarian debate on intellectual property is all but closed. However, many libertarians continue to desperately cling to their fallacies, and so this document remains to guide them back to reason. And he links an article that I think you published on Mises. Um, talking about intellectual property as a negative servitude. Do you want to say anything on that? Yeah. Um, so first of all, that's how these guys, he, he's like, you admit it. Like, aha, you've admitted <laughs> it. Um, well, what it is, is it took me a long time to come to grips with, with, with my position on IP based upon libertarian and classical private law and property rights principles. And as a patent attorney and as a le as a budding legal scholar, I you know I've tried to grab wrap my head around it, and it's not really properly understood and classified in the law. Partly because the law is in favor of it, and they're in favor of this weird thing that makes no sense. So their classifications make no sense. So it finally, um, after studying Roman law and civil law and also the common law, I've come to the conclusion that the proper way to understand what these laws are is to classify them as a negative servitude. Now, what that means is. Or, or you can call it a negative easement in the common law. Um, in the law, there is a the ability to divide your property rights up. You can have contracts and you can have divided property rights. So you can have co-owners of property and you can have it co-owned, not just like 50-50, but you can, you can co-own it in a different way. Like one guy can have one right to do something with the property and someone else could have a different right. And we're all familiar with the case of restrictive covenants, which is like a neighborhood homeowner association where everyone in that community has agreed to bind their real estate, the title, in the in, a, in such a way that all their neighbors have to consent for you to use your property in certain ways. In other words, you can use your property, but there are certain prohibited uses. Like you can't use your house uh, for commercial purposes. You can't you can't build a pigsty on your on your home in a nice little neighborhood. Uh, you'd have to get the permission of all your neighbors or two thirds of them or whatever the rules say. But basically your neighbors are get, you have given your neighbors by contract a veto over a certain use of your property. That's called a negative easement or a negative servitude. And there's nothing wrong with it if, as long as it's consented to by the owner of the estate, which we call the burdened estate. So if I own a home, I can do whatever I want with it, but there's one burden on it, which is I can't use it for certain uses unless I get my neighbor's permission because they have this negative servitude. So if you consent to it, it's perfectly fine. Now, saying I, I've, I've admitted this like it's a big concession, um, it, it would be like saying I've agreed that rape is fine because I've admitted that rape is sex between a man and a woman. <laughs> it is sex between a man and a woman, but it's not consented to. That's why it's rape. So <laughs> c consensual sex between a man and a woman is fine. but non-consented to is called rape. And the same thing is the case with servitudes. And actually recognizing that IP is a type of negative servitude helps you understand exactly why it's a property rights violation. Because 
if I sign on the dotted line and I give you this negative servitude over my property, like in a homeowners association, that's perfectly legitimate. That's called contract law. But if the government assigns my neighbor this right without my consent, then they've stolen some of my property rights because now they've taken part of my property right to use, do, my, do something that I want with my property and they've taken it away from me and they've given it to my neighbor. That's the whole problem with IP. So it's not some kind of concession. And if he had actually read it, he might have understood that. So uh, anyway, so that's the first problem with his mentioning that like it's a gotcha. So most, most of the other stuff in his intro is uh, not say, I don't want to insult it, but I, I don't think it'll make for good discussion. So I'm going to take a couple more excerpt paragraphs that we can probably address. The first one just kind of sets up the tone and the angle for the, the entire article. So I'll read it. Intellectual property rights are the foundation of any advanced knowledge economy. They make possible a capitalistic production of knowledge and information under a division of labor. A dangerous faction of intellectual communism, words never seen together in the wild, is spreading amongst libertarians that wants to eliminate the ownership of information and communalize all information. To achieve this, they rely on a large set of fallacies that they invoke in sequence to confuse the issue. So this classing of um, sort of disbelief or uh, not holding the position of intellectual property as intellectual communism is a is an interesting take. I had not heard that before classed in those terms. Have you? What communism? Intellectual communism, like making the oh, accusation asking. that if if you're not for intellectual property, you are communistic in your ideas. Yeah. Now, to be fair, I use a similar argument. Um, um, for the self-ownership issue. Some libertarians are, are uneasy with the idea of self-ownership because they, they, they sense that there's some religious or something mystical there. Like they think you're divorcing yourself, which is like your soul from your body. So that's the only way you can own your body because they think there's some contradiction in you owning your own body because you are your body. So if you say self-ownership, you're denying that you're your body. So, But they're just wrong. Basically, you take the dualistic position of Mises and you understand that we are persons or actors in the teleological realm and our bodies are scarce resources in the material or physical or causal realm. And this person can own that body. In other words, the body is a scarce resource and someone has to own it because there can be conflict over its use. So if you oppose self-ownership, that means you favor other ownership. That means you favor, you favor slavery. So that's the only alternative. Now, these guys try to make a similar argument, and they think that, well, if you create an idea or information or knowledge, that's useful and valuable, and someone has to own it because it's valuable and because it was created. So if it's not the creator, then someone else owns it, and that's communism. Or if you say no one can own it, then you're, you, they, they, they worry about the tragedy of the commons. But the mistake they're making is they, they assume that everything that you can name with a concept is ownable. That's just not the case. Ownership is a type of property right. Property rights emerge to solve the problem of conflict over the use of scarce resources. That's scarce material things that human beings as actors employ as means of action. And the, the things that are the type of things that – you can have conflict over, we try to come up with rules that assign the owner to that thing so that we can avoid the conflict. It's that simple, really. That's what property rights is about. That's what rights are about. That's what law is all about. Um, now, when we act, we not only employ these scarce resources, which are ownable things and covered by property rights, we also are guided by the knowledge that we possess. In fact, the knowledge part is arguably more important because the knowledge that we have today is what distinguishes distinguishes us from our ancestors from a thousand years ago and it's why we're richer because they had this access to the same intelligence the same bodies the same scarce resources on the earth but they didn't know what to do with it now we know what to do with it so the knowledge guides our action and we in our action we employ scarce resources the scarce resources are subject to conflict so they're subject to property rights the knowledge it's just information that you possess inside your head, and it's the type of thing that is not a scarce resource. It's not a material thing that people have conflict over, and this is easy to see if you imagine people copying each other's techniques and ideas. Someone starts using a wheel. Other people say, oh, that's a good idea. They start building their own wheels, or they see a guy using a log cabin instead of living in a cave, and they start living in log cabins. So they all – they cook their food with fire, right, or they, they use animal skins for, for, um, for, uh, for clothing. So people see other people doing things and they learn from that and the knowledge accumulates and progresses over the generations. This is a good thing. But if I use the same technique you use to make a wheel or to build a cabin or to cook, to make a recipe or to build a factory or to print a book, I'm not taking anything from you because you still have access to your knowledge. So 
it's not intellectual communism because property rights simply don't apply. Uh, things that are infinitely abundant don't need property rights. You know, if there was, if we all had magic and we could conjure up bananas whenever we wanted to, you wouldn't have property rights in bananas because no one would care. No one would steal your banana because they could make a banana when they wanted to. And if they did steal your banana, you would just make another one. You wouldn't care. The concept of property rights would disappear in a world of superabundance. It only makes sense in a world of normal abundance, that is scarcity. But ideas are basically superabundant because they can be copied infinitely without diminishing anyone's uh, possession of them. That's why Thomas Jefferson, the first patent commissioner, said, you know, uh, it makes no sense really to have property in ideas because they're just like flames. Like if, you, if, if I have a candle which is lit and I let you light your candle from my, from my candle, now we both have a flame on our candles and you didn't take my flame from me, right? It was just a copy. So that's the problem with this intellectual communism. And, and actually it's ironic because uh, if you if you take the classic definition of socialism, um, which is the the collective uh, ownership of the means of production, and you generalize it, which Hans Hermann Hoppe does in his theory of socialism and capitalism, to basically identify the essence of it and to distinguish it from capitalism, the essence of capitalism is the private ownership of of scarce resources, owned in accordance with the homesteading rule that is first use and contract, like if. if if you so you own a resource if you were the first one to start using it or if you got it from a previous owner by contract that's it nothing to do with creation by the way that's another fallacy creation is not a source of rights it's a source of wealth creation means production which means transforming input factors into a more valuable configuration but you already had to own the factors so all these people think that creation is a source of rights but it's not it's a source of wealth right and so um and socialism would be the institutionalized interference with or aggression against private property. Now, that's what intellectual property does because if you understand, as I mentioned earlier, that it's a negative servitude, the state comes in, in an, with an institution called the intellectual property system and intellectual property law, and they systematically take and invade the property rights of existing natural property owners by granting these negative servitudes, by taking people's property away and granting it to copyright and patent holders. That is an invasion and an aggression against private property, which is what socialism is. So intellectual property is what is socialistic, not the lack of it. So that's another mistake he makes. And, and one more thing before we go further. One criticism I was going to make of his whole attempt here is that he just has 17 fallacies. So he's trying to poke holes in my argument and other IP opponents' arguments. Even if he succeeded, it still doesn't prove that IP is a good thing. He just shows that we have bad arguments criticizing. To have a really good critique, you need to have a positive theory of, of rights, right? And you also need to carefully define your terms, and you have to understand the legal system that you're critiquing. He does none of these things. I was going to say he has no positive argument, but in the beginning, he links to another argument he wrote about a month before this one called The Ultimate Justification for Natural and Intellectual Property. And I read through that thinking, okay, maybe he tries. He doesn't. It's flimsy. He has no definitions. He never defines what intellectual property is. He doesn't seem to understand that copyright and patent are different. He only talks about copyright. Um, the reason you need to have a positive uh, perspective to contrast someone you think is an error against is suppose he's a suppose he's a socialist who doesn't believe in private property rights. Well, he might oppose my propertarian position on intellectual property. Because he's okay with property rights being violated, okay? So I need to know if he's – is he coming from a fellow libertarian perspective or not? Now, he, appear, he appears to be a libertarian, maybe an anarchist. So we assume he agrees with us on the necessity of, of protecting property rights in scarce resources. But I've just showed with the negative servitude idea that if you grant property rights in information, it necessarily takes away property rights in existing material goods. So he's advocating something that undercuts what he already agrees with. Right. So that's the problem. So you need to define what you mean by intellectual property. Uh, you need to you need to define what you mean by scarcity. He misuses that. So anyway, the entire positive argument he makes is completely scattershot and confused. So I'm going to leave that alone since you didn't go through it and we don't need to. And we have enough to go through here. So you can continue on with your introductory part if you want. You just I mean, you you stole every point I was about to make and, and did it much better than I probably would have. So I'm going to move on. <laughs> 
the next paragraph I think is worth talking about. It's just this. It's more of a, another summary paragraph. But he says, it has been a recent fashion by some libertarians to denounce the, the uh, legitimacy of intellectual property rights on the free market. They believe and promote the idea that all information should be owned in common by all men and that no man should exclusively profit from any information. This makes them, by any honest definition of the term, intellectual communist. So the the immediate thing that I want to say to that is, and this is the core critique here that he's coming from, I don't think either of us on screen right now are arguing that uh, all information should be owned by in common by all men. We're saying that it's not a valid form of property and there is no ownership in it for anyone in common, individual, in small groups or otherwise. That So that's not the position. Okay. Now, now, in and, his slightly, slightly in his defense, some people that share my view, like Jeff Tucker, my good buddy, um, they have used the term, hey, we're in favor of communism for ideas. But so they're lending ammunition. But th that's like that's sloppy speak. What they really mean is. It's good that they're that they're accessible to everyone in common, right? Which ideas are we? Hayek calls it the fund of experience. Like our current age, our current generation has available to it a huge trove of knowledge developed over the centuries by past human generations. He calls that the fund of experience, and that informs the knowledge component of action. So successful action requires availability of scarce resources you can use to to act and availability of knowledge to guide your action in a more and more efficient way. So that second part has grown exponentially over the centuries, especially in the Industrial Revolution, which is why we're so wealthy. So it's good that we ha all have access to a huge treasure trove of knowledge, which, it, it, which is expanding every day because of human ingenuity and human problem solving. So some people have used that term, but it's, it's not quite accurate. So the, the right way is what you just said. Information is simply not ownable. And I mean that literally. I don't mean that it's immoral to own information or the laws are unjustified. I mean that the laws – it's impossible to own information because that's why I classify it as a negative servitude. When you have an intellectual property law, it's really a property rule about scarce resources. It says that instead of you owning your printing press, now this other guy has a negative servitude over it. He's a co-owner of it. He can prevent you from using it in a certain way because it's impossible to own knowledge because – all all rights are enforced by a law and all laws enforceable with physical force and physical force can only apply to physical things in the causal world which are the scarce resources that are subject to property rights so you and, and a way easy way to see this is if you know if i sue you for violating my copyright i don't own your idea i don't own my idea what i'm using is that law as an excuse to have government force take some of your money Okay, so that's the real goal of it. Or the court might issue an injunction saying you cannot use your printing press to print this Harry Potter book or this sequel to Catcher in the Rye, right? So this force is being used against your physical body, threatening you with jail time or with with financial penalties, or or using an injunction against your physical property. So all rights are property rights, and they all affect scarce resources. So it's literally impossible to own ideas. And um, I got a shout out, Adam Sakosin. He was the only one that caught my joke when I when I said that um, Stefan stole my points. Uh, all right, so <laughs> I missed the joke. <laughs> uh, so the second part of that paragraph that I wanted to address uh, was that he said that we hold that uh, no man should exclusively profit from any information. Again, if you if you know a secret and you can get some money from somebody in exchange for telling them that secret. I don't think we're standing against that. The, and the final point that I wanted to make, I think, you know, Stefan already kind of made is that it is much more communistic to attempt to control everyone in the maximal sense, all of everyone's property. Like if I drew a picture right now, I did this in my last stream. I drew a picture. I held it up on camera and I said, look, I just drew this picture. I now have a sliver of control over literally everyone's property watching this video right now. And even, well, everyone. I have uh, I have a sliver of control by the power of intellectual property over everyone's uh, property, everyone's actual property. That's much more communistic than this uh, this uh, anti-intellectual property uh, rights thing. That was well, the point I wanted to make. Let me, let me say this too. So another ironic thing about him calling us intellectual communists. Well, first of all, it's, 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 it's another example of how these people argue. It's very shoddy. They engage in question begging all the time, loaded terms and question begging. Just calling it communism, and we're all against communism, is just pre presupposing that, uh, that there are property rights in information 
or there should be, which is the question to be debated. So it's just a dishonest, tendentious argument. It's just question begging. Um, but the other ironic thing is I think in his second paper or in this one somewhere, he admits that he's in favor of the labor theory of property, which is Locke's argument for homesteading. <clears throat> now, the labor theory of property basically morphed into the labor theory of value of Adam Smith and then Ricardo and then Karl Marx, right? And he echoes it with his stupid, we believe no one should profit from their information or something like that. Well, basically what he's saying is you have some kind of right to make a profit, right? If you perform work or effort, you have a right to make a profit. Well, you don't. You don't have a right to make a profit ever. Um, We're prefisking um, now. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to it. We're, we're prefisking. <laughs> By the way, All right. Tell me, tell me what paragraph you're on. So I, I can't find this paragraph you're on. Uh, so I, I, I just got to I got to fallacy one. I skipped most of the intro because it was just kind of oh, shit talking oh, and oh. nonsense. So I'm going to start with fallacy one right now. Um, gotcha. Intellectual property is bad due to patents. Uh, and I, I'll just read some. I don't know. I'll read like 30 percent of this. 40 percent. Uh, this is by far the most common fallacy as espoused by such legal professionals as Stephen Kinsella. This argument goes as follows. Because patents are monopolies, all forms of intellectual property must be abolished. Uh, simply put, copyrights originate with a producer, while patents originate with the state. One must apply for a patent protection in order to be granted it, but one does not need to apply for copyright protection to receive it. Uh, one only needs to seek protection with the state when a copyright is violated, much as is the case when any other form of market-created property is violated. This makes a copyrighted intellectual property a product of the free market. <laughs> this, is, this is insane. To, okay, let me just finish. As it is created by a producer of information for the benefit of consumers. So I'll stop there for, for that point, but he's marking a distinction between the, the government's magic spells uh, on how you get protection for different types of intellectual property like that changes the the form of property. Did you have anything okay, you wanted so, to say on that? Absolutely. So first of all, notice he never defines anything. He never defines intellectual property mm. at all, uh, which by the way is a propaganda term that his side came up with when the systems of intellectual privilege called patent and copyright, which are separate statutory schemes, when they came under attack by free market economists in the 1900s, the defender says, "No, they're not. They're not artificial monopolies. They're uh, they're not privileges. They're natural property rights." And everyone said, "Well, how? Why do they expire then? And how come there's no physical manifestation?" And they said, "Well, they're a special type of property. They're intellectual property." So it was just a propaganda term. Um, they're the ones that lump these different types of laws under the same umbrella: patent, copyright, trademark, trade secret, and a few others. Uh, you know, they're the ones who defend them. So. And so it's not clear. Is he saying that he agrees with me that patents are bad because they're something the government gives you when you apply and that copyrights are good because you produce them and they're automatic? I, it's not even clear what he's saying. I like, think it may, agreeing with it may be the opposite. Let me read the next little section. In the case of patents, the patent is created by the state. You may even say for the state and may be granted or refused at the will of the state. Additionally, right. if you... If one were to independently arrive at an idea and apply for a patent for this idea, it may be the case that an existing patent on this idea already exists. Not only does this mean that this act of independent production will be refused protection, it will also be banned. And of course, the whole process of searching and checking patents against each other will require that the state uh, consume substantial resources to enforce its patents. Uh, and then at the bottom, this is a summary. All forms of intellectual property must thus be judged on their origin whether they are created by, by a private producer yeah. or whether they're created by a state. Except for patents, all are created by producers and are therefore legitimate okay. on the free market. All right. So he seems to be agreeing with us that patent law should be abolished. So uh, It sounds like it. I, yeah. yeah. But, but for, a, but so for the weirdest reason. But just for the weirdest yeah. reason. Like if I draw a picture, I automatically have the copyright on it. And that somehow makes cool. it different cool. than... Yeah. But go I, ahead. I, yeah. Remember, that was wasn't the law until the 80s. Before the 80s, from the beginning of this country until the 80s, to get a copyright, you had to put a copyright notice on it and you had to register it with the Copyright Office. Now, when we joined the Berne Convention in 88 or whenever it was, um, we agreed to abolish formalities, which means it's, it became, became automatic then. But that's not part of copyright. That's just the current statutory scheme. And if he wants to talk about the origins, patents originated uh, I guess, as he suspects, um, with the grant of privileges by the crown, giving just protectionism to court favorites, uh, like saying you're the only guy who could make this product in this region. 
and then give us – you can charge a monopoly price on it, so give us a cut. Um, uh, and copyrights originated when the printing press emerged, and it threatened the ability of the government and the church to limit what could be printed and hand-printed by the scribes, which, which they used before that to control uh, – as thought control to prevent what the people could read. But would the printing press threaten that? So they, they did a monopoly for over 100 years with the stationer's company, and when that, when that guild – charter expired, they passed the Statute of Anne in 1709, which is the modern origin of copyright. So copyright comes from, literally comes from censorship. So yeah, let's look at the fucking origin of it. Um, now, and you, as, and you can't mark your distinction based on the government's laws uh, as an anarchist. Like that's, that's an appeal no, to an no, authority that you don't believe not in. Only that, not only that, if you're an anarchist, um, uh, if you're an anarchist, you can't favor legislation because you can't have a legislation without the state. So he, he makes this thing like, oh, we well, have an automatic property right. And then you just have to go to the government to enforce it because they monopolize enforcement, just like a property dispute. But that's completely false. You wouldn't have an automatic copyright if there weren't a statute in the first place. Like there's no automatic copyright on the common law. He's totally he's totally confused. And he in the very beginning, he mischaracterizes. He says Kinsella argues because patents are monopolies, all forms of IP must be abolished. That's not my argument at all. First of all, my argument against patents is not that they're monopolies, is that they're they're violations of property rights. They are the ones who admit that they're monopolies. They w the whole argument for patent and copyright is that it's too easy for a competitor to compete with you for these information-based goods because they can just copy the pattern and very easily come and compete with you and knock you off. So the competition is very easy, unlike brick-and-mortar competition, which means that your competitor has to build a store and, and hire workers and all that. They can easily compete with you, and we don't like easy, easy competition, so we want to slow it down so that the originator of this idea can recoup his investment in art research and development costs by charging a monopoly fucking price. That's the whole purpose of these laws is so you're protected from competition for a window of time after you start selling your, 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 your informational-related good, and you can sell it without competition, so you sell it at an above-market cost, which is a monopoly price. That's the whole purpose of it, right? And anyway, I, my argument was against other forms of IP is not because patents are monopolies. It's because they all violate property rights. So everything he says here is wrong. And by the way, in the last paragraph, he says, it's for this reason that Rothbard argues patents are illegitimate precisely to the extent they go beyond the copyright. This makes zero sense. Patent and copyright are completely different, and Rothbard completely mangles that in his – his tepid criticism of patents, and then he comes out and he says, but copyright would be justified if you stamp on the good that you owned it, and then you reserve the right to copy so that a third party can't copy because he doesn't get the right to copy. It's some kind of confusion like that, um, but he uses the example of a mousetrap. Now, a mousetrap is an invention, which is covered by patent law, but he uses the word copyright, but he calls it common law copyright, which doesn't exist. So he's talking about something he's making up in his mind, which never has existed. It makes no sense, has nothing to do with statutory copyright. And, and confusingly, there was something on the common law called common law copyright, but it was more like trade secret, which meant if you are an author of an unpublished manuscript, you have this, this stack of paper in your desk drawer. No one's ever seen it. You intend to publish it in a couple years or next year or whatever. Someone comes in and they steal it and they publish it. You can go to court and you could get an order telling them they can't publish it. And that's actually perfectly legitimate, by the way, because they committed an act of theft or contract breach to take your manuscript from you. But it's not co that's got nothing to do with copyright. But that's what common law copyright was. Rothbard makes up something called common law copyright in his mind, which never existed and has nothing to do with patents. So he's confused and this guy's confused. Fallacy number two. And I'm going to read most of this one. This is one of the few that I'm going to read most of the text of because I think this is core to the rest of the article. And it's also a very important point for intellectual property. He says, information is not scarce. Ideas can be communicated orally following their formulation in the mind, but useful information can only be produced while working with media, can only be inscribed and communicated through media, and can only be enjoyed and consumed through media. I, I stared at that sentence for a while, just trying to figure out where he was trying to come from for it. He's marking a difference between communi uh, communicating orally an idea and useful information recorded on media. I, I'm I think not, I know what he's getting. Okay. I think I know what he's getting. 
Um, he's confused because what he's trying to say is, and he's correct in this, he's trying to say that information doesn't exist in abstract. Mm. Uh, and that's correct. It, it, inf- it But un- ironically, this undercuts his case. So information is just the impatterning of, an, of a carrier or a medium or a substrate because you can't just have letters and mm-hmm. numbers floating in the void. Mm-hmm. But by the way, he's confused because he says they can communi- communicate it orally, but if they're communicated orally, that means the information's in your brain and your brain mm-hmm. in that case is the medium. So yep. it's just the way the neurons in your brain are structured. So information is always the impatterning of an underlying physical thing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, like a CD or a magnetic tape or a book with the ink arranged a certain way or a machine having parts arranged in a certain way. It's just the feature or the characteristic of an object. The problem is that object ha- is already a scarce resource, which has an owner. And the owner owns that resource. And if someone else owns the feature, which Roderick Long in one of his articles calls a universal, then you own everyone's. So like if I own a red Camaro, I don't own redness. I own the Camaro, which happens to be red. If I owned redness, then I would own your Camaro if it's red too. I would own everything you own that's red, right? So you you don't own features of your object that identify the object or make it unique You or the characteristics. You only own the object itself and its physical boundaries, right? So if I own a book, which is impatterned in a certain way, I own the book and the paper and the ink, but I don't own the impatterning of that book any more than I own its weight or its location or its size or its age. So. That's the that's the mistake. So what he's trying to say, I think what he's trying to say is for all basic for basically all useful ideas, they're always on a medium, but that medium is physical. So you can own ideas because to own ideas means you own physical. But he's wrong. You, the physical thing is already owned and you can't own the ideas on it in addition because that would end up taking property rights away from everyone else's ownership rights in their physical things. Well, here the next part is literally going to disagree with you and try and tell you why it does make sense. Often they must be recorded from the physical world using sophisticated instruments to transform physical patterns from one aspect to another, a recordable one. This physicality makes in <laughs> this physicality makes information essentially indistinguishable from media. Information can only exist if media takes a specific physical shape. For example, if one wants a recording of actors riding along a mountain range, one must send physical actors to this mountain range and record their physical presence with cameras riding on film or in digital memory, a process that requires a substantial capital investment. The uniqueness of such an event is self-evident, and even if another producer of information were to hire the same actors to ride along the same mountain range and film them with the same equipment, the resulting stream of information would be completely different in physical structure. This makes information a good that is inevitably bound to physical structures, which are scarce. Therefore, a tangible good. Any existence of an identical copy of this information stream is physically connected to this original recording through acts of communication with the producer's property, and it is impossible for it to be a result of an independent act of creation. He is literally asserting that information streams are physically connected to an original recording. And I don't see any evidence of that uh, assertion. No. no, no. So first of all, um, on a point from the last point, which also ties into this one, remember he said earlier that um, copyright's okay because you produce it. Um, And he's apparently under the illusion that copyright law only protects what we call literal copying, like making an exact duplicate like of a book. But that's not what copyright covers. Copyright covers making a, a literal copy, also a substantially similar copy, which is why you can be sued, um, you can be liable for copyright infringement if you make like a summary of something or, or if you take the basic plot of something or it covers derivative works, okay? So like if I make a sequel, if I write a sequel to Catcher in the Rye, that's a derivative work. It's not a copy at all. It's just a derivative work, but I produced it. The original guy didn't produce it, yet he still has a copyright in that. So this guy's just completely wrong about these identical copies. Copyright goes far beyond that. If he's saying he's only in favor of, he's against patents, and he's only in favor of copyright to the extent it provides identical, it prevents identical copying, believe me, every pro IP person on the planet would hate this guy. They would think he's a commie like he thinks I am, because he basically is against patents and he's against 99% of copyright law, right? Um, His argument that uh, physicality makes information essentially indistinguishable from media. He's basically some amateur trying to 
put into words what Janiel Shulman already did in his flawed argument for IP called logo rights, where he argues that the identity of like a book, let's say you buy, let's say you buy Atlas Shrugged, the reason you pay seven bucks for that book instead of like ten cents for the for a blank book for of paper of the same size is because the the identity of the book is the impatterning of it by these words and that's what makes it gives us identity so you're really buying the book considered as an ideal object so that's the argument shulman tries to make and that's what this guy is in a ham-fisted way trying to argue here but as i already argued you know the physical property of, of an object is what is owned it's not the way it's arranged um uh and by the way, he, he the thing about if you make a photograph or a movie with the same equipment in the same location, that's not covered. He's completely wrong. There are cases in copyright law where – so you can have a copyright in a photograph. So if you take a photograph, there's a copyright in that photograph. There are cases where people have – there's a famous photograph like of the Grand Canyon or some fa some nature scene or whatever. Someone else goes to the exact same location at the same time of year, same time of day, and they take a very similar framed photograph. And they had been sued successfully for copyright infringement, even though it was a separate photograph with different equipment, right? So he's completely wrong. He doesn't even know what he's defending. He's defending a monstrous system because he doesn't understand it does all the things he thinks it doesn't. Um, so a couple more paragraphs from this fallacy and then we'll move on. I think um, he says, in fact, one can determine whether or not an intellectual property is legitimate based on the nature of the information when the information is unique and will never reoccur in the lifetime of the universe then it is scarce and comes only from one original source. So he's saying that if the original source of the information is somehow scarce in time space, that that somehow carries on that scarcity to the information that is, again, physically linked to that original scarce source. Uh, additionally, yes, so just to package it together with this next bit, uh, for information that is unique and specific, the scarcity of this information will grant the one who possesses it a productive advantage. And many others will attempt to obtain this information because it is unique. The only way to obtain it is by either contracting with the original producer or by violating this producer's physical property. False dichotomy, but go ahead if you had anything to say there. Yeah, I don't know what he's talking about there. He, I mean, um, it, it's true that if you get a patent or a copyright, it gives you a productive advantage because you can stop competition. So, so what? <laughs> and, and it's true that. But his, his fallacy here comes from not defining terms. So he never defines scarcity. It's clear from my writing and from our writing, by scarcity, we don't mean lack of abundance, right? We don't mean like, oh, the, the stupid common expression, good ideas are scarce. You know, scarcity is a property of a resource. It means rivalrousness in economics, okay? Mm -hmm. Ideas are simple. They're the classic example in all of economics of something that's not rivalrous because many people can use the same technique or recipe, we call it, at the same time with their own property and without conflict. It's not rivalrous at all. So it's not scarce in the sense of property property rights. Um, so, and he also so, so just just to just to classify that. So let's let's talk about it in terms of like a Bitcoin wallet. You have a private key that ha that has some Bitcoin in it that has value, but there's all you know only one person in the world has that. So there's only one of them. So that's the kind of scarcity that he seems to be talking about, but it's not scarce at all in terms of reality of the pattern that is recorded on the property. The pattern is not scarce qua property. I'm trying to mark yeah, the distinction by illustrating both sides of it. Yeah, and I've, I've argued uh, Bitcoins are not ownable either in the property sense hmm. because they are just um, the way we conceptually understand entries on this ledger, this spreadsheet – which is a distributed ledger copy, stored on many people's computers around the world and updated simultaneously every 10 minutes. So the spreadsheet is distributed. There's many copies of it, and each one is on someone's computer, which they own. They own the RAM chips and the transistors on their computer and the electrons and the way they're, they're arranged. No one else owns that. And so no one – if you were to own a Bitcoin, it means you own an entry on the ledger, which means you own – everyone's computer because you could force them to to wind it back if someone say steals your bitcoin which you can't do right that would be a violation violation of their property rights um yeah so he's talking about uniqueness and he, another mistake he's making is peppered in here he thinks again he thinks creation like if you create a unique the uniqueness has nothing to do with property rights property rights has to do with a resource that is scarce that there can be conflict over and all you have to do is establish an objective link between you and that resource to show that you have a better claim to it. That's what property rights are. 
And the way libertarians do that is the first person who starts using it or the per person who gets it by contract from a previous owner. That's it. It's got nothing to do with creation. So he thinks if you create something, you own it. If it has value, you own it. That's Marxian. You don't You don't have a property right in value. Hans Hermann Hoppe has explained this. You only have a property right in the physical integrity of your resources. You don't have a property right in the value because value in Austrian terms is subjective. It's what other people think about it. That means their opinion about it. But their opinion is the way their brains are structured. You don't own their brains. They own their brains, right? Okay. <laughs> so you don't have a property right in value, which is what this guy thinks. He thinks property rights arise from something being valuable. He, he, ha he, he implicitly believes the fallacy. If you can sell something on the market that is in economic terms, then you must own it. That's just not true. I mean, it's, the word sale is just a, an economic description explaining the motivations of why you do something. And so, even that you have a property right in the profit of the sale of your property. Yeah, if profit is just the, the difference between the money you make from a customer and what you spent to, to produce it. But if you have a right to potential future profits, and it, so sometimes IP depend, defenders will say, I'll say, well, you don't have a, you don't have a right to, um, if, if I copy your book, I haven't taken anything from you because you still have your book and you still have your pattern and you can print as many books as you want. They'll say, well, so they'll crawfish and they'll retreat and they'll say, well, you've stolen my profits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but profit is like money in the pockets of potential future customers. Do you own, again, do you have a right to a profit? Do you own the money in your potential future customer's hands? If they choose to buy my bootleg book instead of yours, instead of your original book, did, did, did they steal their money from you? You see, but they don't want to argue that explicitly because then they start standing like commies. Okay, so I'm going to propose that we skip number three because I don't think either of us want to defend this, what he's attacking. And what he's attacking here is basically that there are people out there that claim that all software should be open source. Uh, and he's attacking that as a communistic idea. I don't think either of us hold that position. Uh, so I'd like to move on if that's cool with you. Well, there, if there was no copyright, you wouldn't, there would be no licensing of software. Um, uh, the only reason we have these open source so software licenses is it's, a, it's it's basically tr people trying to get rid of the copyright the government's automatically pushing on them but um i wish yeah, it was I that simple think... these open source groups uh do attempt to enforce their uh gpl copyright on people from time to time like they, yeah, they do why, use that's it. Why I like it that's why i don't yeah. like it they're not people call it open source but it's it's really got this this stupid copy left share alike bullshit in there which i hate that's why on my website all my stuff i i, I do cc0 or ccby attribution only I hate share alike and the, the GNU stuff. But anyway, that's a different issue. Yeah, and I, I don't have a problem with closed source software projects. Uh, if you want to keep your so your source code secret, I yeah. mean, fine. Good luck. Uh, I you know I don't think you can enforce that, though, with state guns or anything else. So right. uh, number four, uh, nothing is taken away by copying. So uh, what, the parts that I read are going to start to get more scarce so we can kind of get through this. Uh, he says... <laughs> This is an inflationist argument similar to those who promote inflation as a source of unlimited wealth. As Mises <laughs> famously argued, money is valuable only to the extent that it is strictly limited in supply. Its scarcity is its tangible value. This goes to what you just said. And producing money that fulfills this role is one of the most fundamentally beneficial economic acts that the capitalist banking system has achieved. Uh, and then let me let me just kind of round this out by saying... A counterfeit copy of intellectual property achieves exactly the same result as counterfeiting. He's saying copying IP <laughs> is the same as counterfeiting. It gives the counterfeiter wealth by multiplying his instances of the scarce information while reducing the wealth of the producer of the information and of those who have entered into contractual relations with him to obtain part of the scarce information. Inflation is promoted. Production is punished. Um, anything All you right, want to say so on that? Yeah, so a couple of things. Uh, so just like the proponents of IP, half of them will admit that it's a monopoly. They like the the Supreme Court says, "Oh yeah, copyright and patent are monopolies," but they're justified because they encourage blah blah blah. These people are in favor of monopolies, and just and it's basically not denied by the proponents of IP that it it's it sets up what's called an artificial scarcity. Like there's a naturally no scarcity of information because people can copy it, but they don't like that because it doesn't lead to the e efficient use of, 
of of investment into ideas that they think so they think there's a market failure which the government can fix with these little patches um but it's an artificial scarcity this guy's trying to argue that it's good that it's scarce but it's not scarce and he wants to make it scarce with these laws right so that's the whole point of it this inflation analogy just backfires on him because in, the problem with inflation and by the inflation, we mean inflation of the money supply is it is aggressive because it can only happen when the state uses the force of its guns to monopolize and commandeer and take over the entire banking and finance and monetary sector and have a central bank, which forces everyone to use their own currency by legal tender laws. And then they inflate it. And that impoverishes us by inflating, um, causing price inflation and taking our wealth away. So it's like an implicit theft. The problem with inflation is that it is aggression, and that's exactly the problem with IP is it's aggression too because it takes away property rights and people's property. So his analogy is completely wrong. This counterfeiting idea is a trick that a lot of these amateurs and these dishonest arguers do. They conflate everything. They conflate all types of IP, which is why they put the word IP over four different things that are separate, trademark, trade secret, patent, and copyright, and they call them IP. And then they lump – so they lump trademark and copyright and patents all together, although this guy seems to oppose patents. But then they also throw in terms like counterfeiting and fraud and plagiarism and contract breach, which are all separate things. Counterfeiting has nothing to do with copying, right? If I copy your book, I'm not necessarily lying about the fact that I wrote it. I might copy it with your name on it right, and give it away for free or sell it. You know, if you go to a torrent site to get a copy of the latest Dune movie or whatever, it doesn't say it's made by Stefan Kinsella. <laughs> Even if I put it up, it's going to say made by, you know, the guy that made it, <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, the Blade Runner guy. I'm not sure that I agree that inflation is is theft, and, but but I maybe that's the, our no, next no, no, show no. that waits. Oh, okay. It's it's not theft. It's I said it's the effects of it are are, are similar to theft because it okay it. Uh, but I agree, it's not technically theft. The, the aggression is the. Would you consider it an aggression you could use defensive force for, like if, like inflating the yeah. U.S. dollar, is that an well, aggression? I think the, the aggression is is the law that 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 is the the aggression is the tax law that takes our money that lets them set up these institutions and pays the salaries of the Federal Reserve employees, and the and the criminal penalties that are threatened against people. That wanted to set up their own currency, and the and the and the and the and the physical force behind the tax law, which will put you in jail if you don't pay your taxes in what they declare to be legal tender. So all these things are uses of force, which are aggression, which could be you could use force against to stop it. And if they couldn't do that, then they couldn't monopolize the money supply, and they couldn't inflate it. Agree. Okay. Number five. Why admit limited copyrights of some tens of years instead of zero years? An arbitrary distinction. Um, he says the state corrupts property laws and taxes in many ways, for example, requiring property owners to give up a large part of their estate upon death or requiring them to register the ownership of real estate at a municipal office. This violation of the property right by the state does not make the underlying right invalid under a pure free market. Information producers could determine themselves what the extent of their copyright <laughs> is going as far as perpetuity. That is go. their right. That is their right. And what is necessary for them to engage in a capital. I knew that this was going to set you off. So I'm just going to make you full screen and let you go. Per perpetual copyright. Yeah, so, so Aristotle's works, uh, you know, uh, the 12 tables, the 10 commandments, the Bible, Shakespeare's works, all would be restricted. Now there'd be no public domain. I mean, um, you know, to his credit, He's taking his idea to the limit, uh, although for some reason he's not in favor of patents, although I think he is in favor of patents because he thinks like Rothbard, you can still protect machines with this weird version of copyright to the extent they don't go beyond copyright, whatever that means. Um, no, so, so some defenders of intellectual property, most of them are in favor of limited terms. That's what the Constitution says, by the way. Um, so I guess he's against the Constitution now. Um, but um, – uh, most defenders of IP, it's sort of like it's sort of like the minimum wage. You take your average dumbass liberal and you say, um, "Well, if you're in favor of a fifteen dollar minimum wage, why not make it a hundred? Because you know, in our minds, like fifteen dollar minimum wage is is bad. It's going to cause unemployment and dislocations in the economy. But a hundred dollar minimum wage would just devastate the economy, right? Mm, so yeah. our view is that it's a it's a spectrum like the more the worse like the more taxation the worse the more the more the penalties for the drug war are the worse i mean and the, and the weaker the better um 
and the liberal will say something like, well, we don't want to go to extremes. So they want the $15 minimum wage, but they don't want a $100 minimum wage, right? And these idiots, most I, most patent guys are the same. They'll say, well, 70, you know, life of the author plus 70 years, which is like 130 years or so in most cases for, for copyright and 20 and 17, 20 years for patents. That's a reasonable amount. We don't want to go to extremes. Zero is too little and a, a infinity is too long because they implicitly recognize just like the liberals know that a hundred dollar minimum wage would cr- kill the economy. These guys recognize that if you had perpetual patent and copyright terms, hu- the human race would fucking die out because we couldn't do anything because we you couldn't do anything because everything you would do would be a violation of someone's IP because we're using information from the past and you would just we strangle to death. So mm-hmm. they, they favor just a little strangling of the economy. Uh, but this guy, this idiot, at least is consistent. He wants to take it to the end. There's only a few people that's stupid, and that's J. Neil Shulman and Galambos who wanted infinite copyright terms. <laughs> but whatever. Okay, I propose we skip number six because I don't think either of us hold or make this argument that because piracy is not going to – because copyright – can't prevent all piracy that copyright is bad. I don't think that's a, I don't think. But let me, let me say, one, say one quick thing about that one. And that sure. is that one argument, one argument copyright defenders make is that without copyright, you would have no artistic creation, mm. which is clearly false because copyright is widely violated today because piracy is rampant and easy because of the internet and torrenting and encryption and file sharing. So in today's world, we have massive, 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 violation of copyright. Copyright is almost dead. It's not. It's almost impossible to enforce it on a widespread spread scale. And yet we have a flourishing of the arts and, and books and movies and, 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 and all that. So it's clearly their claim is false that you wouldn't have production without copyright because copyright is not enforced now. Number so seven. That's the only thing I'll say. Yeah. A counterfeiter is not breaking. A, I'm sorry for pushing forward. You know, we're on number yeah. seven out of 17. So a counterfeiter is not breaking a contract and is not bound by copyright limitations. One obviously does not need a contractual relation with a property owner in order to be a violator of his property. A thief is not bound by contract to respect the property of the owner of the automobile he is driving away in. He is bound by the law to do so and will be punished for his violation. The role of the contract in intellectual property is precisely the reverse. It grants the right to the consumer to access the property of the producer and thus makes their limited use of the information lawful. Okay, so the, here's the problem here. The, the caption is, is, is kind of right. First of all, it's not a counterfeiter. <laughs> if you copy something, you're not a counterfeiter. If, if, if you sell a mousetrap, or a new iPhone, and I make a similar one, I'm not a counterfeiter. I'm copying you. I'm emulating you. That's not counterfeiting at all. I'm not pretending to be you, you know, or if I copy your book, I'm not counterfeiting. So it's not, counterfeit is the wrong word, but someone who copies you is not breaking a contract. That is true. Uh, really what they mean is um, we've, we've argued that um, uh, some people defend IP law by saying, you're breaching a contract with the producer. And that could be true between the seller of, a, of an ideal good. By ideal, I mean a, a good that has some information or intellectual components, you know, like a, a, an ingenious design or software or, uh, or a novel or artistic thing. Um, the buyer could sign a contract pr- promising not to copy it. I think that'd be rare because why would you pay money for something you can't use? But anyway, but mm. the argument goes, but you know, if I'm bound not to copy the book I bought from you, but I, I I do it anyway and I put it on the internet, third parties could copy it and then they're not in privity of contract with the seller. So they're not violating contracts. So you can't get intellectual property from contract law, which is correct. I made this argument. Now, this guy says a contractual relationship property owner, you don't need a contract with a property owner. That's true. I don't need a contract with you to be held liable if I trespass against your home. You own your home as an absolute property right. Now, in the law, this is called an in rem right. It's good against the world. Contract rights are in personam. They're good only between the parties. The problem is that's question begging. Like I mean, the whole the whole issue is: Are there property rights in information and ideas? And he, you can't establish it by just saying it's property, which is what he's trying to do here, right? Yeah. And by the way, he, he relies on Rothbard earlier. Rothbard does make this argument. Rothbard argues that if a seller has a contract with a buyer and the buyer is not 
supposed to copy it, then that physical item is somehow missing the right to copy because the right to copy is reserved by the seller. Rothbard is assuming that's an in rem right, but it's not. It's a contract between those two. It's in personam right, and that cannot bind third parties. So the third party who, who sees me using an iPhone, if I'm the buyer of this iPhone, he sees me using this touchscreen smartphone with rounded corners, and I go make one. I never had a contract at all. I didn't steal anything. Like I don't need the right to copy to do that. All I need is access to the information that I didn't commit any act of trespass to do. So anyway, that's that's a problem. So this addresses something. Uh, okay, so I'm just. I think I'm going to only do one paragraph out of this. Fallacy number eight: Intellectual property derives from the labor theory of value and is refuted by marginal value theory. And I think this is the salient paragraph here. When a capitalist information industry undertakes to create specific information, it must do so with the expectation that it will be able to sell the information at a profit and thus calculate the optimal supply of this information based on marginal revenue from which it must subtract the costs that will be incurred during production. If it should fail, the capitalist will have to exit the information production industry. All of these prices are the result of marginal value and thus marginal value theory is a foundation for intellectual property rights. Well, for, uh, it'd be better to say subjective value theory, uh, but but not marginal. Marginal has nothing to do with it. Um, yeah. So what if they must do something with the expectation? This is the this is what the any entrepreneur in a free market faces. He faces he has a project in mind. He wants to engage in a project to maximize his profits. He has to project whether he can what he can sell his product for by forecasting future price of inputs and what consumers are going to buy for it, how supply and demand is going to change. That's what entrepreneurship is all about. And part of that calculation is imagining if you're very successful, what kind of competition will you attract and how long can you charge a higher price and how, how, how quickly will competitors rush in and undercut your margin? And if you imagine a project that is just not profitable, you should not engage in it. That's the whole point of the price uh, of the of the profit system. The point of property rights is not to make certain projects feasible, right? Because even with patent and copyright law uh, giving you a monopoly, the ability to charge a monopoly price for for a few decades after you sell a product, you there are still some projects that would cost way too much R and D to innovate that you couldn't recoup even with your monopoly price. So you won't you won't engage in those either. So what should the government do? Uh, tax people and give you a, a prize to encourage even more? I mean, the goal of property rights is not to stimulate innovation, it's to protect property rights. And within that free market, within that private property sphere, people can innovate as long as it makes economic sense. I mean, there's a great little slogan on my c4saf.org site. It's a little, uh, it's a little uh, banner which says your failed business model model is not my problem, mm -hmm. and it's not. People always say, well, can sell it without copyright law. How am I supposed to make a, pro a profit selling poetry? I'm like, I don't know. You figure it out. I mean, <laughs> it's not – you can't make – you. I mean, you can't make a profit selling poetry now with copyright. I mean, so – And this thing about uh, – uh, 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 you, it, the capitals will have to exit the information production industry. Well, first of all, it's not like it's an either or. I mean, there's always a spectrum. Some some types of projects are not going to be profitable, and so, mm. sometimes you engage in those anyway for for elemosinary reasons, right, or for 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 other reasons. In fact, most people produce things not to make profit money off of the idea, but because they find it interesting or it drives them or it's their passion, or they need to solve this problem to make their project, their product better than the competitor's product. Um, you know, Or it's a, a loss right. leader. Yeah. A loss leader. They're, I mean, yeah. yeah, but the point is no one's guaranteed. This is Marxian crap about you're entitled to, uh, uh, you're entitled to a profit. You're not entitled to a profit. The idea that you're entitled to a profit means that if you work, you know, in physics, work is moving a force through a distance. It's not pushing on a wall that doesn't move, right? And and uh, and in 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 economics, the subjective marginal theory of value of the Austrians, you know, says that value is subjective, whereas the Marxian idea is that it's based upon an intrinsic, it's based upon the labor that the worker put into it. That's why they believe the employment relationship is exploitative because if the employer makes a profit. Then there's some left over that is attributable to the work put into it, the labor put into it by the employer, and so you're stealing the surplus value of his labor. This is Marxism. 
And this is what this guy basically is endorsing here. Number nine, <clears throat> copyright prevents the creation of new or derivative information. From the fact that copyright is a market created property right, it is no different from any other property right. One may transform any unowned natural material to create a scarce good, but one may not transform an owned natural material to create a scarce good that one must then appropriate. In fact, if one opts to transform someone else's farm into an arboretum, then the legitimate owner of the farm would have the right to claim full ownership of the arboretum and expel the intruder since it was produced from his property. In order to create and own derivatives of any form of property, one must have an agreement with the original appropriator to secure this ownership. So he's just asserting that uh, IP works the same way. That's what that is. Correct. And, and a lot of the IP defenders do this. They'll say that, well, um, like Richard Epstein and Adam Mossop, these guys say that, well, um, intellectual property works similarly to real property because you can have a lease on it, you can mortgage it, you can sell it, um, you can abandon it. Uh, yeah, and that was true for slavery too. You could own slaves, you know, you, you can, by law, you can make some things resemble other types of property. Right. But that doesn't mean it's the question for libertarians is supposed to be justice, not whether we can make fucking analogies. Right. Um, and, so, and earlier, this guy seemed to think that copyright only covers identical copying, which it does. And now he seems to recognize there's a derivative works thing, which he's too amateur to explain here. But he's talking about the derivative works idea. But the problem is his, his argument is is undercut because. So he says that if you transform your farm into an arboretum, you own the farm because you transformed it. See, that's that creation idea that property rights come from creation. That's completely untrue. If I transform a farm that I own into an arboretum, I don't own the arboretum because I transformed it. I own it because I already own the input factors. By the same token, if I go to your farm without your permission and I transform into arboretum, I don't own the arboretum just because I created it. Right. It's your property. Right. So creation and transformation have nothing to do with ownership, which is what the mistake this guy's making, because Locke made the mistake in his original labor theory of property that you own labor and therefore you own things you mix your labor with. And that led to the labor theory of value of, of Marx and, and Smith. OK, so it's all confused. Um, so th that's the problem there. Um, uh And moreover, if if I were to transform your farm into an arboretum, I'm doing it without your permission because I'm I'm trespassing against your physical property. But if you write a novel like Catcher in the Rye, and this is a real – I bring this up because this was a real case. Um, some some uh, Someone wrote a sequel to Catcher in the Rye, the famous novel by Salinger, and his estate sued them for copyright because it was a derivative work, and they won, and the judge ordered the book not to be published. It's never been published. This is what we call book burning or book banning. Literally, the book ban. You know, I thought we had a First Amendment saying Congress will pass no law infringing on freedom of the press. There is zero doubt that that copyright law infringes on freedom of the press because you have judges telling people they can't publish a fucking book. Mm. And the Supreme Court says, well, we admit that there's a tension between copyright and the First Amendment, but we have to balance it. What do you mean balance it? I mean, you can't balance two things that are totally – that's like saying balance poison and health. Um, and by the way, the, the copyright law is based upon the 1789 Constitution, which has a copyright authorization clause. But the Bill of Rights was an amendment to the Constitution in 1791, a Congress later, two years later, and it pro prohibited Congress from passing laws infringing freedom of the press. So – the later passed amendment overrides the earlier one. So I believe copyright law is 100% unconstitutional. And apparently this guy does too because he thinks it should be infinite and copyright term is limited to limited time. So anyway. Number 10, information is property, but only if it's self-protected. I don't think we hold this position, but I'll just read the first sentence in case you have anything to say on it. A, a particularly bizarre form of fallacy. This states that producers of information have the right to deny access to information only as long as they don't release it from their private networks and must ensure the secrecy by hiring sufficient security. Yeah, he's, he's using the word property in a loose uh, layman economic sense. Where I think he means control or something, but property is the right to control, a legal protected right to control. And as I said earlier, property rights simply cannot and do not apply to information. I never said that information is, is property or is owned ever. Even if you... If you're the only one who knows some information that's in your brain, you don't own it. You own your brain. You don't own the information on your brain in addition. Owning your brain and your body 
gives you the ability to choose whether to reveal the information or not. But if, if you just take a simple fact, let, let's suppose I'm some rich actress who is who is who's hidden her age all her life because you know some women don't want to tell how people how old they are. Let's say she's 62, but people think she might be 55, right? So she's the only one who knows, right? She doesn't own that fact. She just has the ability not to reveal it. You can keep secrets. You don't need intellectual property to keep secrets. But if someone finds out how old she is, they're not violating her intellectual property, right? Anyway. Yep. Number 11, consumers of information are being ripped off repeatedly. Again, I don't think this one deserves much time, but I'll just read the first little section. This fallacy claims that consumers are unaware that the media they repeatedly purchase at specialty stores is limited in rights, despite the declaration of copyright being explicitly inscribed on the product they are purchasing. Do you have any thoughts around that idea that like, if you inscribe some kind of contract on the product that yeah. any, anyone taking that product and possessing it agrees to whatever's inscribed on the, on the product? Well, a couple of things. So first of all, even if, even if th that kind of notice on an object would constitute the formation of a contract between the buyer or the possessor of the object, it still would not bind third parties. And so then intellectual property would disappear because let's say I, let's say I buy a book which has a notice on it and I'm, I'm aware that I'm not supposed to copy it. Or let's say I find it on a park bench and I, I'm, I'm aware. And let's say there's somehow a contract formed, um, which I deny by the way, but let's say there is. If I, if, I, if I choose to put it on the internet and I strip, let's say I strip that notice off. Now other people are, are copying the pattern of information on other people's servers. They never possessed the physical book. They never violated the original seller's pro copyright, uh, pro property rights or contract rights. So it still wouldn't prevent third parties from using it, number one. And number two, no, I don't think a notice is good enough because that's not how contract works. And by the way, this guy earlier argued that it's, it's a property right, not a contract right. Now he's trying to use the copyright, the contract argument to say, oh, it's really based upon an implicit agreement between the owner. The, the notice on a book is not a contract. It's a notice that the government has granted the guy a copyright. It's just a warning. It's like the FBI warning on the beginning of a videotape. Um, if there was no copyright statute and you simply sold the book and on the front page you said the buyer hereby agrees never to copy this book, I don't think it will be binding at all. Just like shrink wrap is not always binding until you open it and you read it. You have to have meeting of the minds. You have to have consideration. There's all kinds of factors in a contract. You can't just have a notice. If that would work, then let's suppose I, I write a book and on the front page or on page 233, I have a paragraph that says, by possessing this book for 10 seconds, you hereby agree to give me $1,000 a month for the rest of your life. And I leave it on a park bench and I sit there with a camera and I wait for people to pick it up and then I sue them for not paying me a thousand bucks a month it's stupid i mean this is not how contract works you can't bind people but they can notice on things no number, so that's completely retarded <laughs> number 12 we cannot know that all instances of media uh hold on what are you retarded so he i know you're not retarded <laughs> but what are you down syndrome <laughs> okay we cannot know that all instances of media have been protected by copyright therefore counterfeiters are presumed innocent again i don't think we're gonna have a whole lot to say here as stated i'll, I'll skip it entirely i don't think that's uh good number 13 we might miraculously be able to independently produce identical information therefore counterfeiters are presumed innocent this is an argument for miracle um obviously I, I guess the only thing that might be worth talking about here would be the instances that are very real and have happened where two people that had, do not communicate and aren't related both invent something around the same time. Um, he would call that a miracle. Uh, and obviously, no, no, no. he go ahead. Now let me let me defend him a little bit here. So okay, earlier earlier in his his seeming agreement that patents are problematic, he does admit that there can be independent invention. Um, and that is one problem of the patent system. It's, it's like, it's extra unjust because of that. Um, and in copyright, I think it's true that for most original works, it's extremely unlikely, like it's extremely unlikely anyone else would ever have written Great Expectations, right? Yeah. Um, however, that's identical copying. He's already admitted he thinks that derivative works should be protected too. So uh, he, he's not just for having the copyright system protect only identical copying. And the big problem is he's assuming that if 
He's saying that I agree with you guys that patent law is bad because it's unfair. It's unfair to stop someone from from independently inventing something just because someone else filed a patent on it. Um, but the presumption there is that if you do independently, I'm sorry, the, the presumption is if you are the originator of something that's unique and no one else came up with it, then you should have a property right in that. But that's just wrong. I mean, uniqueness has nothing to do with property rights. So it is true that if I write a novel, it's unique and no one would have dreamed it up themselves. But that doesn't mean that they're violating my property rights when they copy it. That's the that's the central fallacy there. Okay, number fourteen, third world it's countries. Fallacy. Say again. The fallacy of his fallacy. But go ahead. <laughs> a lot of these aren't fallacies. He just calls them fallacies because people think that means Correct. something that's wrong. Uh, fallacy 14, third world countries do not enforce IP laws, whatever. And he says, whatever this has to do with the legitimacy and economic benefit of IP is unclear. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't think that's a valid argument. Just saying that other countries don't enforce something makes it invalid would not be an argument either. I don't know what, I don't know what he, I, I think, I, I think he's confused here because it, it, I have never heard a single opponent of IP law say that one reason <laughs> that they're bad is because they're not enforced in third world countries. I mean, I don't know what he's talking about. In fact, it's the other way around. You have people like this dude saying that they make the causation correlation or uh, fallacy, which is the rich countries of the world, the West, right? Since the industrial revolution, Europe and America, basically, um, they started getting really rich around 1800 and lo and behold that's right around the time modern patent and copyright law came into being so the reason america is rich is because we had a strong patent system so they are the ones making the correlation and causation fallacy there's something that's correlated which is the rise in wealth in the united states and we also had a, a, a patent system but that doesn't mean the patent system was the cause because you know the united states has also been um um having wars about every 10 years and having uh, tariffs our entire existence uh, and having taxation the whole time. Um, you can't argue that wars and tariffs and taxation are the cause of our success, even though they're correlated with it. And likewise, I would argue that we would be even richer if we didn't have patent law. So that's just a dumb argument. He's got it totally backwards. And his argument, which is the real argument, is wrong. Okay, so we have we only have three left, so I think we've caught up, but the but two out of these three have some meat on them that are probably going to take a little time. So fallacy 15, property must be rivalrous. This fallacy is behind both intellectual communism and fractional reserve banking. If we admit rivalry as a necessary condition, yeah, think about that for a second. If we admit rivalry as a necessary condition for property, privacy becomes impossible and in fact any exclusion or exclusivity becomes impossible. Based on this notion, fractional reserve bankers lend deposits that they do not own on the pretense that their depositors are not using them. Based on this notion, it is impossible to create a club with limited membership. It suffices to say that there is no history of the principle of rivalry to be found in the literature of classical liberalism on the subject of property. Property is an economic institution whose purpose is to secure goods for the individual. Yeah, uh, there's. I'll read a little bit more, but I, that's a good... What, what do you say about his assertion that um, rivalrousness is not part of the historical literature on property? I mean, I, this is so incoherent and confused. I, I don't, I don't understand what he's <laughs> trying to say about private club membership and <laughs> what fractional reserve banking, which I agree is fraudulent <laughs> and stupid, economically stupid. I don't see what the, what the, what in the world that has to do with uh, rivalry or with intellectual property. Um, I mean, rivalry is a an age-old classic economic concept. It's well known to be part of the entire theory of property rights. I mean, go look at Hume and look at some of the older guys, but it doesn't matter. I mean, we're Austrians and libertarians. I mean, Hans Hermann Hoppe is one of our greatest theorists. Just read the first two chapters of a theory of socialism and capitalism. The whole thing, his whole property and, and property rights ethic and his libertarian reasoning and its e economic analysis is centered around the whole idea that the very reason, the purpose of property rights is to permit people to live in a conflict-free way in a world where conflict is possible. But conflict is possible because we have physical bodies and we all have 
needs to use scarce resources to, to achieve our ends. And scarce resources means these physical means of action that we grasp and we employ like tools, uh, food, land, you know, cows, uh, uh, wood, steel, things like this. Um, so the whole reason property rights emerge is because there can be conflict over scarce resources. The whole the whole nature of property is to to allow people to live in peace and prosperity, and harmony and cooperation with each other by identifying who the owner is of a resource when it's the type of resource over which there otherwise could be conflict. So of course rivalry is part of the property rights theory. Without rivalry, there would be no need for property rights. We'd all be angels living in the Garden of Eden with magical superpowers, and this whole conversation would be moot. If no one ever fought each other over property, there would be no need for these rules. Yeah. But let's, okay, so continuing on. But let's suppose that rivalry is a valid precondition for property rights. <laughs> let's just suppose that, okay. Is information non-rivalrous? You can, in fact, create a copy without consuming someone else's copy. Hence, it seems to be miraculously non-scarce. But consider what this the creator... In this is probably the only sentence in his paper that's unambiguously correct. You can, in fact, create a copy without consuming someone else's copy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but consider what the creator intended to create when he invested in his information. It is not an unlimited supply of copies, but the potential distribution of copies that reward his investments. Each information good, whether a movie, a software package, or a book, has a potential for distribution. Once a copy has been distributed to someone and he has consumed the information in it, the potential for that distribution is exhausted. Tell us about property rights in distribution. <laughs> so first of all, he doesn't explain what is the relevance that when a creator intended to create, when he invested in information, whatever that means, what does it matter what he intended to create? Hmm. What, what relevance does that pro possibly have for libertarian ethics and property rights? Nothing. And not only that, it's just factually false. Most people create something with the intent to, to for other people to learn from it and to spread it. I mean, I, I'd say probably 90% of all information is done that way. It's not done with – so he's crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, it's just – what was the other? What was the other? Oh, oh, oh! What was the other part after the intended create that we just went over about property rights? Oh, yeah. So he's basically assuming a right to profit. He's saying, yes. yeah, you can't, you can't profit, you can't profit from this if people can copy it. Diminishing okay. someone's potential to profit is theft. Is kind of the argument here. Yeah. So he thinks that you have a right to an income stream. You have a right to profit, which means you have a right to the money in potential future customers' hands, but you don't. Yeah. Let no me read the rest. That's not the. Problem. Yeah, let me read the last three sections on this. Focusing back on intellectual property, he says, we see that when movie bootleggers record and distribute a theater release recorded on handheld cameras, they are distributing a copy of lower value than what the creator intended, producing less enjoyment in the consumer while eliminating the distribution potential for the property that the owner won't get back. By reducing the potential of intellectual properties, pirates reduce investments in the prospecting of new intellectual properties and wreak economic growth and cap and wreck economic growth and capital accumulation. Thus, we see that intellectual property is in fact rivalrous, although the intellectual communists do not understand the capital aspect of it and refuse to consider its existence. Are we refusing well, again, to consider the existence? No, he's uh, just the fact that you face competition when you make in a good or a service that is heavily that's easily copyable doesn't mean that it's rivalrous that that just doesn't follow rivalrous is an economic property of a good and it doesn't have that he's already admitted that in the very beginning people can copy it without diminishing the others so he basically thinks you have a he thinks that if you can't make the right amount of profit the way you quote intended or wanted i mean you know the whole purpose of capitalist property rights libertarian private property rights is not to give you everything that you intend or want. And it's not the purpose. He's, he, he, this is why it's important to have a coherent theory of rights and understanding of libertarianism, which he doesn't have. Uh, I propose we skip number 16, unless you have anything you want to say about a non-scarce or a, a post-scarcity society. Um, I don't think we have any no. positions there. Uh, and then number 17 um, is, I guess, the last one. Yeah, here it is. I'm going to, I think this, I'm going to read the whole thing on this one just to round it out. 
Uh, number 17, intellectual property relies on state privilege and protection. Intellectual property owners are per perfectly capable of seeking out and destroying counterfeit copies of their property, much as they can provide for the protection of any of their rights. It is the state that prevents them from doing so and protects pirates. In fact, the economics of intellectual communism makes it impossible for it to exist in an anarcho-capitalist society as dreamed by these very same libertarian intellectual communists. For capitalist courts to provide protection to counterfeiters against intellectual property owners, the value the counterfeiters derive from counterfeiting must be great enough for them to justify purchasing protection in excess of the value intellectual property owners derive from purchasing protection on the exclusivity of their, of their property. Because the acts of counterfeiters demonstrate how little they value the property, they are counterfeiting. They would never actually purchase any protection against intellectual property owners. Intellectual property rights from the fact that they create value would become the law globally. This implies that it is only under the state and more likely an ideologically communist democratic state that counterfeiters can obtain any protection at all in any other in any other, their operations must remain at the margins of, of obscurity. And before um, we comment on that, let me just say, last call. We I have not been taking your questions this whole time because I wanted to make sure we get through the article. Now that we've hit the end of the article, uh, we're, we'll have a brief period that we can take some questions if you have them. So get them in now. I'll be looking for them while we discuss whatever that was. <laughs> I'm impressed, we, I'm impressed we, we got through them all. Why don't you, what do you think about this one? <clears throat> You want to take this one first? So he's saying that um, DROs in a free society would would choose to, uh, to, to defend intellectual property rights. Um, I mean, he didn't mention DROs, DROs specifically, but that would assume that there's a demand for intellectual property uh, great enough to support sort of a separate side economy of DROs that all consensually contractually agreed uh, to abide by certain intellectual property rules. I would certainly not be a part of that system of DROs. So I guess there would be some sort of sidecar uh, economy. Uh, there, there would be two economies. There would be an IP respecting DRO network and there would be a non-IP respecting DRO network. And and I, if, if he's trying to make the argument that, um, that the pro IP network would be more profitable and would outcompete the others, I don't see the evidence for that uh for that just for, for I mean, that he's, argument he's arguing, he's arguing backwards he, he's trying to say that if he could imagine dro's would do something then that justifies it which is just not true i mean what if you have an assassination market you know it doesn't mean that it's just i thought we were supposed to be libertarians here right and again the distinction i made earlier these ip guys want to argue that copyright i guess in this guy's case it's a type of property right, which is what we call an in rem right, a right good against the world. So like you said earlier, you don't need to have a contract with, with trespassers to prevent them from trespassing against your home because that right in that property is good against the world. So let's say there's 10,000 little private property communities in the world, each with their own private laws, but they're all libertarian, which means they all basically respect the basic property rights. They, they, they respect the idea that you can own a resource by either homesteading it when it was unowned or buying it by contract from someone else, right? So that's the basic order in the world. So in one of these communities, someone might own a home. And if some outsider from another community comes into that village and trespasses against their home, they're violating the property rights of the owner. They're trespassing, right? Um, even though they don't have a contract, it's got nothing to do with contracts. But in this guy's conception, if there was patent or copyright law, then if the community one, a guy writes a novel, and let's say they have some weird contract there, I don't think they could or would, but they, they have some kind of copyright like contract among the residents there where everyone's agreed to limit their ability to copy, remember, create from and learn from information, which no one would do because this is suicidal. But okay, let's say this stupid uh, Gallimbosian strangerous community <laughs> has these rules. For them to have a real property right, then they would have to be able to go into all the other 10,000 communities in the world and prevent these guys from using their own printing presses to copy copies of the book, um, which would which would be a violation. It would be to, to enforce that you'd have to go and invade their houses to, or their factories or their or their publishing shops to stop them from doing that. But that would violate the already baseline rules of property rights, which is that I own my printer, right? Um, so. 
he is just it's just so incoherent it's hard to even argue against this well l- let me try uh, let me let me try so like yeah. um like re- i commonly say that rights are mutual reciprocal understandings between people so yes you and that goes for property rights as well so you you'd have a, a yes. libertarian society that would reciprocate property rights and they would have dro's that would contractually agree to adjudicate disputes around property rights, uh, you know, with, I'm sure, yes. some kind of spelled out normative property rights uh, rule set. Yes. Uh, and and I guess this guy is arguing presumptively that that there would also be this uh, ubiquitous idea of intellectual property and that DROs would also, just like normal property, have a rubric of rules that they would, and, uh, they would adjudicate disputes around. Um, so why uh, why wouldn't there be a, a potentially a libertarian society that had a system of DROs that reciprocated because the people consent right the people are consenting to the DROs representation including that um, infringement or that reduction in their real property what's a good word for real property because I feel like when I when I'm talking about intellectual property I talk about real property versus IP but calling it real property is kind of begging the question or or uh, uh, what's the, in the law in the law, real property means immovables like land and 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 uh, and improvements on the land like houses and, and what, personal what property. Normative cor- property. In, in the, what would you call it? Corporeal <laughs> or material or corporeal it has a okay. body, it has a physical substance. Corporeal I like, property. I like that. Yeah. So I mean, like, uh, so you could have a society that um, chose to to reciprocate yes. property rights in a way that included intellectual property, and I think his assertion here is that. He's saying that that would outcompete uh, because um, IP creates value, and that value would then allow them to prosecute people. So I don't think I don't think it would as a factual matter, but for the same reason that war is expensive, so it's expensive to be an aggressor, and just like if you had a private society, I don't think you'd have a you don't you wouldn't outlaw drugs even though you could because people have to pay to do that, and they're not getting any benefit from it, right? So I don't think it, it's just not economically viable. Now, some some anarchists like David Friedman and others who are pathetically willing to property to their discredit, um, they think that you know it's unpredictable what private rules a given regime or or covenant community would adopt, and that could be intellectual property. Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. Um, and like I said earlier, it still wouldn't be intellectual property because it it could not be good against the world unless every community in the world signed some big treaty and they all recognize this, mm. which is logically possible. But that just means it wouldn't be libertarian. I thought we were supposed to be libertarians because <laughs> a libertarian community is one in which these DROs have courts that um, that decide disputes based upon the core fundamental principles of libertarianism, which is if there's a if there's a resource in question. Like my factory, or my paper, or my uh, or my uh, body, or my ink, right, or my money. Then, when someone else claims the right to control that over the over the the presumptive owner, the natural owner, the possessor, whoever, then we settle that dispute by asking the homesteading question and the contract question. Um, if if I can show that I homesteaded the property, then I'm the owner. If I can show that I bought it from a previous owner by contract, then I'm the owner. And that that settles the question. So the only way you could have the court in uh, recognize the right of the claimant to stop me from using my property to make a device, a product, or to print a book, they would have to grant this negative servitude to them, which would violate my existing property rights, which means they wouldn't be libertarian anymore. So I guess it's logically possible, but they wouldn't justify it. It would just be an unjust system. And by the way, there's a reason why we have statutes that the copyright and patent are statutes originated by the federal government. There's the Patent Act and the Copyright Act, and their, their origins are the Statute of Monopolies of 1623 in England for patents and the Statute of Anne in 1709 in England. All statutes in that announced by legislators. So why didn't they arise on the common law by private court decisions the way the common law originated the vast bulk of the private law that we all think is roughly libertarian from the common law and the Roman law. Why didn't they do that? Because they can't, these types of legislated artificial schemes cannot emerge organically in a decentralized fashion in any kind of libertarian private property dispute resolution process. Um, just it like came out, it came have, out of a, a king's desire to sort of post facto justify his desire to control 
the copying of information. Like there were kings that used to have to, or that wanted to control what information could be, could and couldn't be copied on the printers at the time. That's what copy but right, he, the right to copy that was granted by a king. But in a private property libertarian order, there are no kings and there are no, there are no legislatures. So you can't have legislative schemes and you can't have law being made by command or decree or dictate of a committee or of an autark. So it's if you understand anything about the actual historical origin of these laws and their nature and libertarian property rights and the purpose of private dispute resolution, you would understand that you could never have these rights emerge from private arbitral decisions, just like you couldn't have the Environmental Protection Agency or OSHA or the Center for Disease Control or the IRS or the SEC, Security Exchange Commission, or the Food and Drug Administration. None of those things could emerge organically on a private property system. They would have to be created by the decree of a committee of elected bureaucrats, which we call legislators or Congress critters. It's just <laughs> it's, it's impossible to conceive this happening in a just way in a real property rights respecting libertarian society. So if this guy wants to argue for um, and kind of a uh, an anarchistic world where anything goes and where whatever these committees or these 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 rogue judges in these weird communities decide is just just by fact of they're, they're issuing these these judgments i mean you could have slavery you could have assassination you could have uh you could have women being killed for having sex outside of marriage you know which we had in the past because they weren't libertarian societies mm. so mm. it doesn't prove anything in my opinion all right, sir. This was a, an excellent show. I'm, I'm happy that we made it through everything. Uh, I appreciate you coming on and joining me for the talk. If you're welcome back anytime for any reason, where can people find your work? Are we not going to take questions or, or you want to close it? I, I didn't get any questions. I did get a super chat that I almost forgot to mention. That Moose, thank you for the $20 super chat. Uh, he says that was a very good stream. Since you're profiting from this stream, is it intellectual property? Thank you for a good stream, even if it is all intellectual theft. Thank you, That Moose. Remind me over on Discord and I'll give you the supporter role for your donation. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, we didn't okay. uh, we didn't actually get any questions there at the end. I think we I think we not I think we fisked the hell out of it. <laughs> All right, good. Um, no, I have nothing to promote. Uh, people can um, if they want more information on all this, it's all this kind of stuff is on my C4SIF.org, Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom uh, website. Um, um, that's I, I just did a um, I just did Walter Block's uh, law and economics course. I, I guest lectured for him a week or two ago um, on intellectual property, and I did a pretty systematic overview of the case against it, which I touched on in bits and pieces here. So if anyone's interested, just look up my stephankinsella.com and one, one of my recent podcasts um, is my uh, is my IP lecture for Walter Block's class, which which is a good recent summary of the case against IP. All right, sir. Thank you very much. And everybody, thanks for watching and, and uh, participating with us in the comments. It was a good time. Until next time, take it easy.